There, I played it right this time. <laughs> you were messing with your mic or whatever that first service, so I wasn't sure if you were going to the yeah. course. I'm <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, my goodness, goodness, goodness sakes. Hi, Randy. Morning. See, the last service, everybody was saying hi to each other. And then when I say good morning, I kind of got a... Uh, and, and you know what? It happened again. So I'm going to try one more time. I'm feeling a little left out. Good morning. Good morning. Ah, okay, somebody's a little overzealous over there, but <laughs> we're okay. So no pressure. The, the Sunday after Easter, you know, we have visitors who come in. And I, one of the things I always, you know, want to impress upon... Those of us who are here at Inspire, our members of Inspire and, and longtime attenders is, is that we want to make sure that visitors are seen but not loved on. Amen? But, but they want to be seen. And so make sure if you see somebody either now when we're greeting each other on the way out, that you at least just say hey and, 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 and get a name, you know, and, and let them go to their brunch. Um, but, well, I mean, that's an important part of Sunday, right? No pressure, though. No uh, pressure, you know, despite the fact that somebody, I'm not going to say who it was, but his initials are Brad Mann, told me that he had a guest here today and don't screw it up. I was thinking about my, uh, I, I saw my grandson and I was telling the, uh, uh, Jerome and Teresa over here about him because he's, he's four years old and he, you just never know what's going to come out of his mouth. And one day we were talking about what he's, he wanted to do when he wanted to grow up. And I said, would you like to be a pastor like grandpa? And he said, no. And I said, oh, really, why not? He says, I'm not loud enough. <laughs> it's probably true, probably true. So the Sunday after Easter, the world has changed, and yet in that seven-day span, most people don't know it yet. They don't realize it yet. And often, that's true, even if you look at it historically. Some of the biggest changes that occur in history happen so subtly and so gradually that we often don't notice it, do we? Until all of a sudden, oh, that changed. But it was in the works a long time. So when we talk about following Jesus, we're talking about now the development of the early church after the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. And you have this gaggle of people from increasingly diverse walks of life coming together to follow Jesus. And as you might imagine, if you get a whole bunch of different kinds of people in the same room, it can be a little messy, amen? Huh? How many of you have a family like that? Give me an amen if when you get together for Christmas or Easter and you have that dinner, there are just certain topics you avoid, amen? amen? Right, okay. So here's the thing. If we begin the process of following Jesus by focusing first on the details of, should I do this? Should I do that? How should, how should this happen? Should I avoid, obey this rule? What should I do here and that? We're going to get lost, we're going to get lost. Jesus wants to start by helping us focus. Now, there's, a, there's this story about this father who, as he was raising his kids, loved to teach them how to do puzzles. And, and so they would do puzzles together. And so when they were younger, they were doing simple puzzles, you know, little 15-piece little puzzles and things like that. And as their kids got older, as a family, they would start to tackle increasingly larger and more complex puzzles. And they had actually compiled quite a stockpile of puzzles in, in their back closet. And the father says, okay, now we're going to go ahead and tackle like a 2,000-piece puzzle. So he gets it. And he always likes to check and make sure everything's in order. So he takes the puzzle back to the closet where all the other puzzles are at. He's got boxes open and pieces here and covers there. And He opens it up and, and he looks at it and everything seems to look okay. So he puts it all back together, cleans up the closet, puts it up in the shelf until the day that, okay, everybody's got a, it, it's a rainy Saturday, it's a perfect day for a puzzle. So he whips out the puzzle 
And he says, I got this really hard one. The family's like, okay, great, let's do it. So he throws all the pieces on the table, and the family descends upon the puzzle, okay? As a team, they're going to knock this baby out. And, of course, they're really good at it. So you got one group over here working on the middle section. You got another group over here working on all the edges. And they're excited about it until about an hour later, when all of a sudden, they are frustrated because they cannot get it. They cannot, they can't seem to put the pieces together. And, well, the, you know, Dad, this is supposed to be something that brings us together, not makes us all frustrated. What's going on here? And then he thought, hmm. And he grabbed the cover to the box and he looked at it. And all of a sudden he realized, oh no, when I was in the closet, I put the wrong cover on the box. This whole time, we've been trying to assemble the pieces of a puzzle, and we don't actually have the right big picture. We have to start with the big picture if we're going to follow Jesus. And that big picture needs to be ever before us. It's the big picture that guides the details, not the other way around. Amen? Now, you'll kind of maybe start to understand what I'm getting, back, getting at here a little later. I'm not saying the details aren't important. They are. But they must be guided by an understanding of what the big picture is. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to have you stand for our reading this morning, and let's have all the young ones go off with Miss Kate and Miss Carol. Oh, she left. Orion didn't want to sit through me. Oh, well. All right, that gives me permission to be more boring. Our reading this morning comes from St. Paul's letter to the church in Rome, where he says, Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another, whose faith is weaker, eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Read the yellow with me. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall. And they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we invite your Holy Spirit now to be with us, to be our teacher, to open our hearts and our minds. Spirit, we also ask that as you do that, you might take anything that we feel personally a little cluttered with and lay it on your altar, Jesus and entrust it to you in order that we might make room for what it is you want to give us today. And I'm just going to invite everybody here just for 15 seconds to think about whatever that is. Because we all have it. We all have stuff. And just take a moment and just, just say to yourself, Lord, I give you this. Transform our hearts and minds now, Lord, in every way that pleases you. We pray this in your holy and unique name, Jesus, all God's people said, amen. You can be seated. So Paul, when he writes to the church in Rome, comes from an interesting and really kind of a unique perspective. See, what's happening is, is that the church starts off mostly by converted Jewish people, which is not insignificant. Fiercely monotheistic. It's amazing that you're seeing these fiercely monotheistic Jews. In other words, they only worship God, one God, all of a sudden embracing this person, this risen Jesus. They called him the Christos as God. Okay, They became known as the people of the way. At first, a very small group, but quickly growing. So, 
Paul is dealing with when he writes these letters to the churches, lots of conflict that naturally happens when you get people from different backgrounds, because it, does, it starts off with just converted Jews, but now all of a sudden, Gentiles, non-Jewish people are joining the church, and they're all bringing into it their own thoughts and assumptions and presumptions about how it is that we should follow Jesus. And as you can imagine, this can create a mess. And so you have Jews who are trying to follow the 613 laws of their oral code. It's called the Shokan Aruch. I've got both volumes in my office. 613 laws they had to follow to be faithful to God, including how to eat, when to eat, what you can eat, what you can't, all that kind of stuff. And then you have Gentiles who are like, oh, I don't know, I just eat whatever I want, whenever I want, but I believe in Jesus. And they're like, the Jews are like, no, 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 you've got to follow our rules. Now be careful about judging the Jewish people. A lot of times us Protestants like to, we, we kind of, Shake our head, oh my gosh, 613 codes, I can't even handle 10. Anybody give me an amen on that one? But, you know, before we get too uppity about 613 laws, that's ridiculous. How many of you have ever read the IRS code? Huh? Or even the North Dakota group of laws. I got a legislature back here. Huh, Dawson? Kind of like drinking from a fire hose, isn't it? Yeah. See, he's so shocked he can't even open his mouth. I recently ordered for myself the 2023 Clergy Tax Guide. Just the Clergy Tax Guide. 423 pages. I'm not an accountant. So you had this mix of people with different expectations and assumptions coming together, and he's addressing them. Now, Paul is an interesting case because before he was Paul, his name was Saul. He was from a place called Tarsus, and Saul was an interesting guy. He was a hybrid. He was Jewish, and in fact, quite an accomplished Jewish leader and scholar. He was a Pharisee. He was trained under a guy named Gamaliel, who was a well-known and well-respected teacher. And yet, his other side of his family came from Gentile background, and so Saul was an interesting case because he had this Jewish rootedness and this Gentile rootedness, and to boot, he was an actual official citizen of Rome, so he had all the rights and privileges that go with that. So Saul hates the early church. He sees them as a virus, as a, as a disease, as something that needs to be eradicated, and that this Christos that they're worshiping. Well, they're just crazy. He doesn't see Jesus as just a, well, another religious choice in this pluralistic world. No, 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 no. He saw Jesus as evil. Evil. And he begins to gather all of the authority he needs to eradicate this church and this early movement of people called the way. He oversees first recorded martyrdom of a Christian disciple named Stephen. Watches, holds everybody's coats as he's stoned to death. And so Saul is beginning to develop quite a reputation. And in our text that I'm about to get into, he's on his way to a city called Damascus. To do what? To persecute and round up another group of troublemaking Christians. And on his way, he's knocked to the ground. Now, he's got accompaniment with him. He's got other people with him, but he's knocked to the ground and he's blinded and he hears a voice that only he can hear. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he answers, who are you? Who are you, Lord, that I'm persecuting? He said, I am Jesus the Christ. And because you persecute my people, you persecute me. We underappreciate what a moment this is for Saul. Everything he understood to be true and right and good is flipped completely upside down. The one person that he thought was the devil turned out to be God. And all of a sudden, everything he knew and understood about the Old Testament and the writings and the words and scriptures of God 
came together in a completely new way. And he saw the truth. And though he saw the light, he was still blinded. Now, this is where we pick up the story. His servants bring him into Damascus. And then God begins to work on somebody else. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. And the Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. Notice the detail there. That's kind of crazy in a way. Look at, look at when we read Scripture, can I, just, can I just offer an observation for everybody? We often get too caught up in how much Scripture we, we, we can read. Well, I'm going to get through the whole Bible in a year. Well, okay, that's fine if you want to do that. There's nothing wrong with that. But I will stress this. It's not about how much Scripture you get through. It's about how much Scripture gets through you. Slow down. Pay attention to the detail. Have a good study guide with you or a good Bible that has notes. Take the time to look the cross-references up. Slow down. Little details matter. Judas on Straight Street, these are the kinds of little details that lend themselves to the idea that the Scriptures, the Holy Scriptures, the Bible, Old and New Testament, are true and utterly unique among all religious writings of antiquity. You don't see these kinds of strange and odd details in those other writings. So go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying in a vision... He has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. So God has given Saul now a vision that this guy named Ananias is going to come and pray for him. Saul's world is just spinning now. Have you ever been in that place in your life where you feel like your world is spinning? Where you feel like you're not sure what right and wrong is anymore? You're not sure who you are? You're not sure of a lot of things? It's not a comfortable place to be, is it? It's not. But you know what? God can do great things with that place if we just open and turn towards Him. So, what happens? Lord, Ananias answered, (laughs) read this with me. I have heard many reports. Stop there. I have heard, (laughs) you know what this is? It's a, it's a but. Ananias, go to this guy on Straight Street, Saul, and, uh, but God, but, uh, I don't know, God. Ever let your butt get in the way of following Jesus? I have. I'll start the confession parade. I have. And I'm not trying to come down on Ananias. The truth is, we can understand where he's coming from. Lord, I, I've, heard, I've heard reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. God, but, but, God, but, 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 but. Now, what's behind that? Of course, understandably, there's fear behind that, isn't there? There's fear. He's afraid. And who could blame him? Who could blame him? But let's be honest. A lot of times, in those buts, there's a little bit of pride and arrogance, too. I'm going to follow you, Lord. I'm going to follow you, Jesus. I, just tell me what you want to do. Well, I'd like you to do this. Oh, well, well, maybe not. But God, I, you know, I got other things I got. Well, but let me do this first. But I don't have the resources I need. But, but, but. Uh, but God, are you sure? Are you sure? That does, just doesn't seem right, God. Are you sure? Hmm. 
I think us, when we do this, Ananias, I actually relate to him, don't you? We're a little bit kind of like the engineer from Apple, the company Apple, who at a company meeting years ago called out the boss, Steve Jobs, publicly. He's an engineer. He isn't the boss, but he's going to call him out. And I want to show you this clip of how Steve Jobs answers him. And you don't have to understand computers and software. Don't worry about that. Just, just listen for the tone. And men, if you struggle to understand tone, just ask the lady next to you. They'll tell you. Okay? All right. Watch. And, and, and take in how Steve responds. Yes. Mr. Jobs, you're a bright and influential man. Here it comes. <laughs> it's sad and clear that on several counts you've discussed, you don't know what you're talking about. <clears throat> I would like, for example, for you to express in clear terms how, say, Java, in any of its incarnations, addresses the ideas embodied in Open Doc. And when you're finished with that, perhaps you could tell us what you personally have been doing for the last seven years. <laughs> Uh. Awkward. You know, you can please some of the people some of the time, but one of the hardest things when you're trying to affect change is that people like this gentleman are right in some areas. I'm sure that there are some things OpenDoc does, probably even more that I'm not familiar with, that nothing else out there does. And I'm sure that you can make some demos, maybe a small commercial app that demonstrates those things. The hardest thing is, what, how does that fit in to a cohesive, larger vision that's going to allow you to sell um, $8 billion, $10 billion a product a year. And one of the things I've always found is that you've got to start with the customer experience and work backwards to the technology. You can't start with the technology and try to figure out where you're going to try to sell it. And I've made this mistake probably more than anybody else in this room. And I've got the scar tissue to prove it. And I know that it's the case. And as we have tried to <clears throat> come up with a strategy and a vision for Apple, um, it started with what incredible benefits can we give to the customer? Where can we take the customer? Not not starting with, let's sit down with the engineers and, and figure out what awesome technology we have and then how are we going to market that. Uh, so you hear what he's saying, right? In a, in a nutshell, what he's saying to this engineer and really to everybody else is, listen, you've got a piece of the puzzle. You're right, but there's a lot more pieces to the puzzle. And the big picture doesn't start with what you think this is good at. The big picture starts with this. What's going to help people? What's going to meet their needs? What's going to make their life better? And let's answer that question and then work our way back to the technology that will do that. In other words, what he's saying, let's start with the big picture and let it work its way back to the details. And one of the things that, that is related to this is this idea that we get caught up judging other people and other, even other believers over all kinds of things that, though they are not unimportant, are not the big picture. Hmm? 
Grant over there. I heard him try and talk about the book of Acts and, and the, the doctrine of Israel and how it fits into the sal- God's saving plan. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And that person over there, they're too worked up over this. And this person over there, they don't follow that festival. And they don't do this. And they don't believe this. And you don't line up perfectly with this confession. And we miss the big picture. Because when we do that, we're putting ourselves in place of the only one who gets to judge, to be judge and jury. And by the way, also the only one who not only is judge and jury, but also does what is necessary to save us. Jesus. Jesus needs to give Saul the big picture. And in the process, he's going to give Ananias a little bit better look too. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. What's the particle of grammar after the word go? Folks, thank you. Exclamation point. It isn't, well, I hear you, Ananias. And I want to be sensitive to your feelings. So let's just think on it a while. No, no, no. It's go. Go. Trust me. Trust me. How many times in our lives have we hedged on our obedience to God because maybe at the core we're afraid and our fear is a little bit bigger than our trust in God? Amen? Go. This man is my chosen instrument. And by the way, this is just like God in Scripture. He chooses all kinds of unexpected people to do His will all the time. So if you think, oh, I don't have the qualifications to serve God, think again. Think again. Saul didn't even want to do it. This is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. Why? Because he's this hybrid. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. He doesn't say, Ananias, I'll show you how much. No, he says, I will show him how much he must suffer. Saul becomes Paul, the apostle, and he does suffer, probably more than any other disciple. Mocked, scourged, shipwrecked, whipped, beaten, and eventually beheaded at the hands of Nero Caesar for his faith and proclamation. Yeah, he'll suffer. But we get so caught up judging another man's servant, don't we? Isaac, you're not my servant. You're Jesus' servant. And it's not my place to judge you. Yes, if you come and ask, we can talk, right? But... I'm so heartbroken how many times I see churches judge each other. I love the TV show, The Chosen. Anybody watch that show? I just love that show. Is it perfect? No, probably not. But it's pretty good. And it breaks my heart when I go on YouTube and I see all these videos just ready to criticize it. Because they don't line up exactly with our confession or our doctrine. Come on! There are people starving out there that need bread. So God, in essence, says to Ananias, listen, there's a bigger picture, Ananias. And it starts with what people need. And this man I am sending because he was lost, but now he's found. He was blind and he's about to see. He was hostile, but now he's going to be humble and mobile. And he will see a bigger picture that transcends all the stupid little things that we just fight about in religion. Hmm? 
Peter had to, say, had to learn the same lesson from Jesus. After Jesus is resurrected and ascended, he comes back and, well, before he's ascended, he comes back and he restores Peter because Peter's feeling pretty bad about himself, cock a doodle doo you know what I'm saying? And so he restores Peter. And in the process, Peter already starts losing focus. This is recorded in the Gospel of John, and so what's interesting about the Gospel of John is that whenever he's referring to himself, he never uses his name. He, he always refers to himself as kind of in the third person, and the disciple that loved Jesus, he called himself. And so Peter looks at John, and so what happens is Jesus says, he restores him, he says, but Peter, and you're going to serve me, and you're going to head my church, but Peter, someday you're going to be led somewhere, tied up to somewhere you don't want to go. And he was referring to Peter's ultimate death because Peter, too, would die a martyr. In fact, all the disciples do, right? So don't tell me that this is some kind of conspiratorial lie. It's not. People don't die for lies. He ends up being crucified at his request upside down, again, by the same empire that did Paul. So in this moment, Jesus is dealing with Peter and Peter, Peter does, he does what we, a lot of times we do. It's like, ah, oh God, you're getting a little too personal. What about that guy? What about that person over there? Peter said, asked him, Lord, what about him? And he's referring to John. And Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? In other words, don't, don't judge my other servant. Just worry about me. You must follow me. I think the world would be a lot better place if we just worried about keeping our own nose clean. Amen? Yeah. Uh, there is this wonderful, I don't know if he's Irish or Scottish, all I know is he's got the cool accent that I wish I had because it always makes you sound smarter. Alistair Begg is his name, a well-known scholar and pastor and preacher. And he was at kind of this, this conference full of highfalutin theologians and they were debating all kinds of things, doctrines and confessions and blah, blah, blah. And uh, Alistair Begg basically says, folks, we got to refocus on the most important thing. He says, there's that famous question that says, you know, when you find yourself, when you die, what reason is it that you should be allowed into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven? And he, he alludes to an interesting part of Scripture where Jesus has an interaction with another thief who is dying and hanging on the cross next to him. Let's listen to what Alistair says. If you were to die tonight and, and, and you were getting entry into heaven, what would you say? If you answer that, and if I answer it in the first person, we've immediately gone wrong. Because I because I believed, because I have faith, because I am this, because I am continuing. Loved ones, the only proper answer is in the third person, because he, because he. And think about the thief on the cross. And what an immense, I can't, I, I can't wait to find that fellow one day to ask him, how did that shake out for you? Because you were, you were, you were, you were cussing the guy out with your friend, You'd never been in a Bible study. You never got baptized. You, never, you didn't know a thing about church membership. And, and, yet, and yet, you made it. You made it. How did you make it? That's what the angel must have said. You know, like, what are you doing here? Well, I don't know. What, what do you mean you don't know? Well, because like, I don't know. Well, you know, we, uh, uh, did you, Excuse me, let me get my supervisor. They go get the supervisor range. So we have just a few questions for you. First of all, are you are you are you are you clear on the doctrine of justification by faith? <laughs> the guy said, I never heard of it in my life. And and what about let's just go to the doctrine of scripture immediately. This guy's just staring. And eventually in frustration, he says, On on what basis are you here? 
And he said, the man on the middle cross said, I can come. <laughs> now, now, that's the... Amen? That's the big picture right there. There's only one judge and justifier and savior and God. And we all gain entrance because he says so. No one else based on no other things. And when we keep that big picture in mind, it will help us to love others and to not judge. And when we work that backwards into our lives, we'll learn to follow a little bit better every day. Gracious Father, there's no other religion that does this, that says this, and we see that now. Holy Spirit, you've revealed that to us. All the rest say, do this, do that, achieve this, climb to this height, and maybe you can make it. But you, Father, reveal the truth that in our incapable natures, full of sin and brokenness and rebellion, you have come and you have occupied the middle cross. And if we turn to you, you say you, we can come. Help that humility to guide us in our interactions with other believers and with other people in our lives. Help us to see that big picture and to share that above all other things. We pray this, Jesus, in your unique, holy name. All God's people said.